first thing we're going to do is uh, have the children sermon. Um, and so, children, please pay attention. Uh, get a little closer to the camera and or your, your computer or whatever. And, and uh, let's talk about today's reading. And uh, I, I'm reminded about today's reading. Uh, actually, I, I actually I need a favor for me. Um, so you, you can you can follow along in today's reading um, as we go discuss that. But it reminds me of my daughter Kira. Um, we were on her when she first started uh, first grade uh, about reading because you know we really we set down the law to where we said we really want you to start reading. Uh, let's put, put, you know say you read a half an hour a day, and oh my goodness, it was pulling teeth. You know she would skip it, she wouldn't do it. Um, then all of a sudden, her first day of school, the teacher said, she came running into the door and, and said, you know what my teacher said? My teacher said we have to read a half an hour a day, so I'm going to get started reading now. And then, it, then the reading took off. And, and I, I sort of understand sometimes what parents, you know, what we say, we need a little bit of a different person, a different voice, maybe a little different authority. So again, with your permission, parents, I'm going to ask as your pastor children, um, to, we need your help. Uh, we need uh, your help for the people who um, are, are closed into their house or they're closed into their uh, retirement areas um, and they haven't been able to, to reach out to the outside community. So what I'm asking you to do, uh, you know, periodically, maybe, you know, if you could do it once a day or once a week or a couple of times a week, you know, you know let's say three times a week, to write a letter, just to say hello, introduce yourself, and just say we're thinking about you, or draw a picture, draw one of your beautiful pictures, and uh, we'll send it away. Um, in one of my letters, we put the address of Heritage House. Um, you can always send it there. Or some of you have the uh, church's directory. Maybe you just decide, like this week, we're going to do this page. And we're going to send each of these per people here, or maybe for the next two weeks, we're going to send each one of these, you know, groups of people a letter just saying we're thinking of you. Um, if you could do that, that would be great. Um, if you run out of stamps, bring them to the church. We have plenty. So thank you. Uh, let's pray, you know, for the children. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I just, I thank you for them. I thank you for, for who they are and the excitement that they bring. Um, I hope uh, we will see them very, very soon. But uh, give them this charge. Give them what, uh, this charge to, to really help the church, to help the people in their church in, in their letter writing or, or in their drawing of pictures or, or maybe even a phone call and just telling them that we, we miss you. So uh, I just ask also that you protect them. You promise that you will guard, you know, going forward and behind and above, and so please do that with these children. I ask this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. All right, let's have everyone come back to the computer there. Um, oh, uh, I should give you a warning. You know, usually, you know, I know I sort of go over my 10 to 12 minutes, maybe make it 15. Sometimes it even hurts to go 20. But I feel today I should give you a warning that I'm way over my self-imposed time limit. But I don't feel like I have the usual constraints that I normally do. So, uh, when we, before we read the Gospel here, uh, I would like to try um, to, to do what we normally do, and that is to, to sing our, our Gospel acclamation. And man, I hope you please don't let me do this by myself. Please sing along here with me. Let your steadfast love come to us, O Lord. Let your steadfast love come to us, O Lord. Save us as you promise. We will trust in you. Let your steadfast love come to us, O Lord. The Holy Gospel according to John, the ninth chapter. As Jesus walked along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, 
that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, it's someone who, who looked, looked like him. And he kept on saying, I am the man, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes open? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and spread it on my eyes, and he said, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went to wash and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the, Phar they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. And the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I can see. So the Pharisees says, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath laws. But the other said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And he said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called his parents of the man who had received his sight. And asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is now that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said that this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to the Messiah would be put, to the, put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, and now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you would not listen. Why, do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? Oh, then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And the man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, You were born entirely in sin, and are, are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I might believe him. And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. And some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now what you say, we see your sin remains. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Oh, help me out here, please. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. The man born blind, 
sort of remind me of a, just a quick little story here of when I first met Patty. She did not have the greatest eyesight. And some of you might be thinking like, oh, that's how she was, uh, you know, maybe the reason why she was attracted to you. Or for her, she, when she didn't have her glasses on, I looked pretty fuzzy. And if she was, in, especially if we were practicing this social distancing. And actually in college, she had someone break into her apartment and sold, stole some things out of the apartment. And she actually saw them. But because they didn't have, she didn't have her glasses on, she couldn't identify any of the people who broke in. And after LASIK surgery, you know, after we were married, her, her eyesight is now really pretty good. Stories about healing blind men are pretty common in the Gospels. And a common element is a man as a beggar. And they use the spittle, which would definitely not be appropriate today and Jesus touching the man's eyes. But John's gospel is different on a couple of accounts. Usually the man is shouting to be healed, please heal me, Jesus. But this man is quiet. And Jesus doesn't even engage the man who he's healing. He is just really, this man is a catalyst for the discussion between Jesus and his disciples about sin. But what intrigues me in this passage is the blind man's journey to faith. And with this, maybe we can look at sight in a little different way. So the disciples ask a question, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? And that was a very common thought during this time. It was thought that both physical or mental or emotional illnesses were manifestations of sin caused by either you, the individual, or their parents. And even though this may seem sort of barbaric today, but do we still hang on to some of that thinking? I'm reminded that, you know, in the Bible, when uh, his, Job's friends started talking, they started going, Job, you must have done something to bring on this calamity. And he said, no, I didn't do anything. And so I was wondering if we're thinking that today. I wonder if we're still thinking about that maybe with this virus. Is the wrath of God coming down because of our sin? But the problem is, is it really doesn't fit my picture and hopefully yours about our loving God. And if this was true, if this was God's wrath being shown under this, uh, you know, thing of this virus, well, then the rest of it also has to be true that the people who put Jesus on the cross should have gotten smoked then, you know, at that time. And the cross should have never happened. And we know that that's not true. And if you believe, like what we believe, that Jesus died for you and for me, that means that we are all due. We should have all been smoked. But we know a different story, that Jesus did not come to condemn but to save. Okay, enough of what I say. Let's see what Jesus said. Jesus said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's, work, God's works might be revealed to him. Now, here, here, God's work equals Jesus' work. And Jesus calls himself the light of the world. And this light is meant to show how God works in the world. It needs to reveal it. And Jesus will use this situation to glorify his Father. The work has continued with us today because Jesus lives inside of us, each one of us. And a good time to take our mission statement seriously is right now. Proclaim the gospel, serve one another, and grow in love. And with Christ inside of us, we can, we can do that. So let's take a look at this passage here. And to me, this passage, you've heard me say it a couple of times up here, that this one especially reads as a play. And as I, I look through this, I, and I read this, I feel like I'm, I'm distanced. I feel like I'm just part of the audience watching this, this scene after scene after scene, and overhearing and seeing what's happening on the stage. And as I go through this passage, I believe that there are six scenes in this play. 
And as, as all plays, it's really important to, to, to see who is on stage and who is not. So before we get started, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at scene one, and I look at scene one as verses one through seven. And I titled this scene, The Question, The Answer, and The Healing. And maybe you want to stop the video just in a, in a minute here, and with your family or whoever is you know, watching this with you or by yourself, ask yourself who's on stage at this moment. Who is talking and who are they talking to? Who is not talking? And some other things that you, you might notice. And then, maybe what intrigues you, which intrigues me, start asking yourself about what about the faith of this blind man? So you might want to stop the, the video now, and so you can answer those questions. And so the disciple asks a question, and Jesus answers the question. And what is the blind man doing? It seems like the blind man is sort of like a prop on off to the side of the stage, because he's doing absolutely nothing. Maybe just standing there, maybe he's start continuing to beg, you know, but the thing is, is that no words are spoken to, by him or to him for now. And re Jesus reveals that he is the light of the world. And Jesus heals this man, not right there, but from a distance. He says, go, go wash in the pool of Shalom, or Siloam. And God's con continuous pursuit of us, we don't have to be righteous. We don't have to have our act together. Heck, we don't even have to have faith in him. God continues to pursue, pursue, pursue. Many times I, I'm out in the parking lot with a blessing board, and parents come asking for prayers for their wayward child, or one that has fallen away. And I keep on reminding them that God is not done writing this story. God is not done writing their story. God is pursuing, pursuing, pursuing always. And you know what? We should be very thankful that God does not treat us like we deserve. And I should probably hear a little bit of an amen after that. So scene two comes along, and I see scene two is verse eight through 12, and I call it the neighbors. And again, you might want to stop this video now and do the same thing. Who's on stage? Who's talking? Who, where is this blind man uh, who now has sight? So you notice here now that the scene has changed. Jesus is gone, the disciples gone and just the neighbors and the man. And for me, this scene is, is a comic relief of this passage. It gets pretty serious here, but in this case, I think it's just downright funny. Now see, the neighbors, the neighbors during that time did, simply did not move away. They stayed in one area, one community, because there was protection in that community. So you raise the family, they raise their family, they raise their family. And it sort of reminds me a little bit of the rural setting that we have here, but it was nothing like that compared uh, as, as the, um, this time during Jesus. Those families stayed right close together. And so this man comes into the neighborhood, sight restored. And I could just ma imagine him saying, hey, everyone, it's me, Uncle Jeff, look, I can see, Aunt Kayla, look, it's me, it's me. And the response is comical. Is it him? It, 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 it can't be him. It must be someone that looks like him. Not a chance. He was blind. Now he, this person is seeing. And all along, what is the man doing? The man is saying, no, 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 it's me. It's me. I would have loved to see that on stage. But what about the man's faith? What about the man's faith? He knew who healed him. He knew that he called him, this man called Jesus. Somehow he knew his name. 
And right here in this scene, the important part of this scene is that this man is given his first opportunity to witness about what Jesus has done in his life, and he does. Did people listen to him? Doesn't appear so. And it doesn't appear to matter if you ask him. He just, he tells all he knows. And this journey of faith that this man is on, and that we all are on, is starting right now. God's pursuit of him causes the first step. The man knows Jesus' name. Scene 3, verse 13 through 17. Again, you can stop the video and answer those questions. I call this scene the first interrogation. Picture, picture this, man is in front of the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time, the ones who know very well the law of Moses. And we go from comedy, from the last scene, to conflict. There seems to be a violation of the Sabbath law. And that, my friends, is really bad. You see, when Jesus took his fiddle and his mud and started mixing it around and kneading it together, kneading like he would do in bread, but in this case by making, you know, a, a mud bath, kneading is one of the 39 categories that were strongly prohibited on the Sabbath day. When Jesus bent down and mixed, he did it and it went against the Sabbath law. So therefore, according to them, according to the religious leaders, this must prove that Jesus was not close to God. So the man has another chance to tell his story. Again, he is a witness, witness to Jesus' miraculous healing. His faith journey is now beginning to take his progress. He takes a few steps, probably two steps back, or two steps forward, one step back, as our faith journeys do. And now, when asked, the man says he's a prophet. Perfect? Perfect faith? No. Jesus Christ the Messiah? No. But the man is moving on. His imperfect theological knowledge does not stop him from witnessing about this man called Jesus. Do you see the lesson there? Proclaim the gospel means proclaiming your story and how this man called Jesus has influenced your life. We can all do this. And I'm thinking there's no better time right now than do it than our present age. And you know what? You could even use words if you have to. The next scene I have uh, is, is for six verses, verse 18 through 23. And this time it's the parents' inter interrogation. And again, you can pause the video. Ah, this is sort of a short scene, but a, a powerful, because the, the, you can see why the Pharisees brought in the parents. If you bring in the parents, uh, maybe, maybe with interrogation, maybe we could find out if he was truly born blind. Because if he wasn't born blind, if that was the case, no blindness, no miracle, and no problem. And they quickly found out, rats, he was born blind. And the parents, they wanted no part explaining how their son can see now. They said, go ask him. He is of age. The fifth scene is from verse 24 to 34. And it really is the second interrogation, but maybe not. Because you'll see that this interrogation flips. So my, my title of this is, Who is Interrogating Who? Alright, let's set, set the scene here. It switches back to the man in the courtroom of the Pharisees. And this passage is packed. Twice the authorities hold their knowledge up to the man and expect him to accept their position, to accept their position through intimidation. And each time the man counters with his own knowledge. 
This phrase that you see, give God or give glory to God, means to tell the truth. And this is what the man is doing. He may not know the law of Moses as well as the Pharisees, but he knows through experience about this man called Jesus. I was once blind, but now I can see. So listen to these, this man's words. He flips the interrogation. Starting in verse 31, it says, God listens to the one who worships. This is the man speaking. God listens to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Skipping verse 32 and going to verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This one who is on the faith journey, this man like you and I, this is what he knows. And how could Jesus do this healing if he wasn't from God? That's his question to the Pharisees. If this guy was not from God, if Jesus was not from God, he would not be able to do the healing. And I'm reminded about Psalm 15, verse 1. Oh, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be given the glory. And sometimes this hurts me because I'm sometimes a glory thief. I steal the glory that God deserves, and it's really easy to do in my profession. And I was wondering if any of you can relate to that. Oh, the Pharisees are ticked. They have no answer. This gospel passage at the beginning in verse 1 started with a man born blind. And now this passage has started with, the, and then started with the question of physical blindness now has turned into spiritual blindness. At the opening, physical blindness, now spiritual blindness. And the man's spiritual sight is growing every day. But the Pharisee's spiritual blindness comes to the front during this scene. Yes, only God can do miracles. Yes, this, this healing is a miracle. They should have known that. They should have known better. This should have led them to Jesus as the Messiah. But sadly, it doesn't. Miracles rarely do. So where do we place our faith? Do we place it in the grace and truth of Jesus Christ? Or faithfulness in the laws and rituals that we do? And be very careful out there, and including myself. Our voice may say one thing, but our actions may say something different. Last scene of the play, verses 35 to 41. Jesus is finally back on stage. And so pause it for a minute, and then I will continue. And I love the first part of this verse in 35. And when he, Jesus, found him. I love that part. Did you notice the vast difference between the ending of the last scene to the beginning of this scene? The religious leaders kicked him out of the synagogue, sent him out. But what happened at the beginning of this scene? Jesus found him. Again, it reminds me of God, God's continued pursuit, pursuit, pursuit. And the man was found. And Jesus asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man asked him, honestly, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. And all of a sudden, the flashback occurs over my mind about last week's story about the Samaritan woman at the well. You are talking, you're, you look, you're, I'm talking to you, Jesus is basically saying to the woman. And the man said, just like the woman said, Lord, I believe. And right there is the culmination of man's faithful journey. Lord, I believe. But not really the end, but the maybe the beginning now of his rest of his journey. He saw the light of Christ and believed, and now his mission is to share the light of Christ with others. Some of you remember the moment when you said these words for the very first time. Others, this is all you know. You, you, you've always believed in Jesus Christ. You always have known the love of Jesus in your heart. 
And if you know this love, don't you just want to share it with others? We now live in a perfect time to do just that. Share the love of Christ. Proclaim the gospel. Not live in fear. Not live in fear because his love casts out all fear. Let's not hoard his love. And the time, final two verses talk about judgment. Those two verses are so radical that you may want to pause to take a breath. Jesus is saying that judgment is based on believing in Jesus and the one who sent him. And that one who sent him is God the Father. It's not in our actions, it's not in our good deeds, but in our faith in Jesus Christ. Children, I've asked you to write cards. Parents, I've asked you to maybe make phone calls. All of those will not get you any closer to God. But this is what God's people do during this time. And you know, our baptism seals us for this day of judgment. It is through our baptism that God chooses us, and we become children of God. What about the others? Well, God continues to pursue them, and God pursues them through us. Are you ready? Are we going to be like that man and simply tell him his story? That's all it takes. This man didn't know theology like the Pharisees, but he truly had sight, not physical. Yeah, he did have physical after the end, but especially spiritual. Don't be afraid to tell your story. You know what? It might just save a person's life, the life that really counts. Amen.